like you to welcome this to, to our team. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. I'm putting my coffee very far away, otherwise I will spill it. So before uh, I begin, I am also an RPCD, uh, Morocco, so uh, 88 to 92. So hi, Tim. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, and uh, another RPCD uh, is also here from Morocco. I hope that there's others in the room. Yay. There are. Okay. Good. Excellent. Um, and as it happens, it wasn't on purpose, but we have a sort of an RPCD Morocco thing going at our firm. So both <laughs> Olga and I work together, in fact. And we have two other RPCDs. Are, um, part, uh, another founding partner and another senior associate. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that if you want to know more later. We also have a table outside uh, with the peace building folks, so there's more information about SAM partners there. What I'd like to do though is, it, can you just make sure there's an even number of people at your table, and if they're not, just raise your hand. So there's there's an even number here. So, so perhaps if you wait, you just turn around and, and work. Sure. 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 Sorry, like me, your name tag. Wait just for a second. You don't need to wait forever. Just for five. Seven. That's great. Okay. Together. All right. Just find a partner, you just need a partner, right? Just identify that person you're sitting, you should sit next to them on the other side. Yeah, I'll be your partner. You know this is a So you're an extra, not a partner? I'm an extra. You can be a facilitator. All of you facilitators. I know about the answer. Did you so everyone has a partner like this? Yeah. Uh, okay. So before I lose you all, I everybody have a partner? So are you sitting next to your partner? Is the, is that person that's right next to you? Okay. So if you've done this exercise before, that's fine. I just ask that we do the exercise, and this is hard for RPCs, I know, but in silence, if we just be quiet for a few moments, uh, everybody will have lots of ideas about it, I'm sure. But just do the exercise, and then we'll have lots of opportunities to talk afterwards, right? So your only goal in the exercise is to make as many points for yourself as possible, right? You want to make as many points for yourself as possible. You don't care about the other person, how many points they get or not. That doesn't, it's not in, of interest to you, okay? So you're clear about your goal. This is how you get points. So Olga's gonna help me demonstrate. <coughs> so you're just gonna take your partner's hand, take your partner's hand like this, with your elbow on the table. Oh. <laughs> If the back of Olga's hand touches the table, I get a point. And if the back of my hand touches the plane of the table, Olga gets a point. Okay, so that's, that's all that's required. You have, you'll have 10 seconds to get, we're going to all start at the same time. So why don't you get set up, I'll let everybody get set up. Grab your, okay, that's fine. Analyze that for a moment. 
So I'm going to ask one pair that I noticed. There were several pairs doing the same thing, but I just I'm going to tell you the one I happen to see out of my peripheral vision to demonstrate for us what they did without speaking or explaining. I just want to see us all to see. So if you could just, Jackie, if you could just perhaps stand up. I know what you would normally be using. I know, but I'm still going to use you. So just if you could sort of stand up too and just show the rest of the room what you did. Ready? Just show us what you did. OK, that's it. And what's your name? Jim. Jim. So if you couldn't see Jim's face when the exercise was actually happening, but it was quite intense. <laughs> and he was really engaged in the exercise with all of his strength. So in your minds, what did they think about this exercise? What was the purpose of this exercise? They each got zero points, right? No one got any points. OK. To win. So they were thinking win, okay, was maybe the purpose. What else? I wanted to beat him. Oh, to be, okay, well, let's just be clear. <laughs> as, as a gentleman, I wanted to let him beat him. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're all conflicted that way. Let, exactly, let him win. Okay, what else are they thinking? What else are they thinking? Does this exercise remind them of something? Okay, so it's an icebreaker, so it could just be fun. They're just engaging it because I asked them to, right? So it could just be a fun game. What else? There's something about self-identity in that. It, okay, about, say more about that. Um, that. I mean, I don't want to say like it's a pride issue, but there, there's something there that somehow in the winning or the losing of the game, it, it speaks something about you. Right? So you don't want to win or you just simply don't want to lose. Then that, that, that is a, that's something that reflects on us. Right? As people, as leaders in particular. Anything else about what they're thinking? In this case, win win, how, how would that be reflected in their behavior? If, yes, in their case. Okay, so, so let's just go to another pair that happen to be at the same table. So, Tim and Jane. Janet. Janet. Tim and Janet, if you could just demonstrate for us what you did. There you go. <laughs> okay, thank you. And about how many points did you get? We got 20. 20. Each or total? Each. Total. Okay. No, so each. Eight. It was 20 times. Yeah. Yeah, 20, 20. Wow, okay. So what were they thinking? <laughs> okay, they were thinking earn, earn points. Win-win situation. And maybe there that comes back to our comment about win-win. I didn't care if she won. <laughs> Didn't care who won. Okay. Anything else that they're thinking? Yes. They inspired to beat the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that might be conspiratorial. Some sort of conspiracy yeah. going on to beat everybody else. Anything else? Last comments? I would say you could break your arm doing this. <laughs> One way or another. <laughs> okay, so there there there's ways that might be the way the process that we use to achieve our goals might have some risks associated with it, and we need to be cognizant of that. All right. So does this sort of rep reflect, Jim and Jackie, up a bit about what you were thinking about the exercise? OK. And does this reflect, did you, have you done the exercise? No, no but, uh, but uh, uh, so, uh, so I, I gave up right away. And then so she figured out that what was happening. Well, and, and my first thought, and I actually said it, was this can't be about arm wrestling. So, so, so it was early on sort of figuring out. That. Okay, yeah. but that requires a little bit of communication, right? Mm -hmm. I did say, please do the exercise in silence, and they said, well, that rule doesn't work for me because we want to achieve our goals, right? So. If the purpose of the exercise was to win, then I, you know, I saw many people in the room have behavior, exercising the behavior that might not have helped you reach your goal. Because what did I say about winning? <coughs> Get points and it didn't matter. Right? It just didn't matter what the other person achieved. So we, it, it, the way of thinking about, in my view, leadership, I think sometimes we, enter a conversation, we bring a great idea to the table, and it 
sort of begins to resemble arm wrestling a little bit, right? Because I'm going to convince you that my idea is the best one. And so then I struggle and struggle rather than taking a step back and saying, well, what is it about us working together that will move us even further along and optimize our opportunities for value, right? To create value as a team. And that can be your team, sort of Friends of Morocco team. It can be your role on the board of NPCA. It can be in your life in general, right? And I think often our mental model is this is going to be a struggle. And so our behavior reflects that, even if we are unconscious of it. So what we're going to do, just for the next few minutes, Kate asked me to talk about leadership. And I thought it would be more interesting if we raised our awareness about our own leadership styles and then shared conversations, questions, and strategies. So what I was going to do now is ask you at your tables, right, is to think about three questions. Three questions and take five or six minutes to talk through them, and that's a very short amount of time, I realize. And the other pieces of the program will help us come back to some of these questions, I hope. The first question is, what in your current role, that can be as a group member, it can be on the board, it doesn't have to be within your life as an RPCD, and that's our purpose in being here, so. That's probably your main point of reference. But what are your current leadership challenges, right? What are your current leadership challenges? Second question, what are the strategies that you used to address these challenges, right? And third, what makes an effective leader? And it's up to you at your table to just what's effective, right? Is that getting the job done? Is that making sure everyone participates? Is that, I don't know. That, that's really up to you to sort of discuss at your table. And it may vary depending on what the context is. But what makes an effective leader? So why don't we just take five, six minutes, I'll check in, talk about those three questions, and then I'm just going to pull ideas from tables. I'm not going to go around one table at a time because there are too many of us and the time is rather short, but I'll just pull ideas from whoever raises their hand at the end of sort of the five to six minutes for your table conversation. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, I had these microphone. I was never going to get your attention. So, what are some of the current challenges? I, I heard a few, but uh, just anybody want to mention what are some of the current challenges? Asking for help. So, not being able to ask for help. Uh, I guess just a hesitance to. Okay, hesitance to ask for help. What else? Having follow through when somebody volunteers. Okay, follow through. So, not asking for help, then not getting the follow through. Uh, arranging for some kind of continuity or recruiting new leadership. Okay. <coughs> Getting people in the mix who maybe have not played a role before or are younger. Within the one of the three. Okay. Having a, a diversity in age. Aha. Uh -huh. So, I, yes, I was hearing you talk a little bit about so you have a lot of Gen Xers in your particular group and it's trying to get some of the baby boomers and the veterans into sort of. And where are they from? Where are you from? Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, great. Aging out. We had at least three <laughs> countries right at this table yeah. where Peace Corps hasn't been for decades. And so our problem is the opposite. We only have older members. Okay, so there are only older members in the group because Peace Corps has not been in their particular friend, their country. Of, so there are participants in a friends group that then doesn't have that, that continuity afterwards, no. that generational continuity. So there's no one to, to replace them. Aging out, I think, is that what you <laughs> <laughs> Any other challenges? Time spent. 
time. <laughs> yeah, the time commitment and the, the, the ask of you as a volunteer or that you're asking of others. Yes. Uh, recognizing people's strengths and weaknesses. You can't pick a person to do something you want to comfortable And you may not know that in advance. So right. somebody may be, you know, volunteered or, or nominated for a post that you don't necessarily know how to figure out if they're the appropriate person for that. So what do you do about that? How do you, so we have a little bit of it is, you know, time and, and hesitancy to ask for help, which are kind of linked because if you do everything, then you and you go ask for help, then you're, you're feeling overwhelmed. But what are some of the strategies we can use to address some of these issues? Follow on, choosing the right person for the right job. What do you do? I think we just try to get to know each other better. We have a lot of older members and some newer ones. And okay. Part of the hesitancy is just not knowing the person and knowing their skills or their, their willingness to get involved beyond the superficial level of the group. And, Okay, and so, you're, uh, Mar what group are you representing? Uh, well, I'm in Morocco, but I'm northeastern New York. Okay, northeastern New York. Yeah. So, regional group, yes. Okay, so well-defined positions, right? So are people really clear about what their roles and responsibilities will be? Um, I'm representing Friends of Korea, and we've kind of aligned ourselves with the embassies and consulates all through the uh, states. And so as we're aging out, we're trying to branch out to bring in people who are friends of Korea who may not have been okay. our PCBs. Uh, okay. So expanding membership beyond okay. Peace Corps. Great, that's a great strategy. Great. Other other ideas, especially if you're trying to get to know people, how do we make that difficult conversation? What, what, that out. Sometimes you accept that an institution is a living organism. It's going to have its ebbs and flows. So it's important to write down the best practices, to have oh. the experts quantify it, and categorize it, and okay. have it there ready for the next people. So, <coughs> have to reinvent the wheel. so you want to record it and share. Best practice. Great. Was there something else over here? Did you have another? No? Um, you're talking about how to deal with um, trying to perhaps redirect people towards their strengths, mm -hmm. and perhaps in a positive way. Um, and um, I know for, um, I'm on the MCA board, but co I was coming from the DC group and we did a huge 50th anniversary and we dealt with a huge amount of volunteers. Yes. And I, I learned that there's some certain people who are good at certain things and, and, and it was great because once you found their strength, they did amazing stuff, but they might not necessarily be great in this other thing, other like So um, I think we've learned to kind of encourage them in what they do really well, rather than um, kind of help with that. Okay. A lot, it becomes more and more fun, but it is hard, especially starting out with the volunteers, but also the fact that they want to help. Is it is should be celebrated? Okay, and that's we love the fact that you're helping. Right, and it's hard because once you get a volunteer and somebody's enthusiastic, you have a tendency then to kind of that's the go-to person, irrespective of their particular skill set. Mm -hmm. Especially you're, if you're in a under-resourced, and I mean that sort of in all ways, not just money, but <laughs> lack of people, you know, lack of time. If you're in an under-resourced situation, then you kind of tend to go to the same people over and over and that can be not as effective as you'd like. So recognizing that, as I understand it, and then channeling them, and then trying to make up by just getting others to do the other work. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, anything else? Any last strategies? Yes. Okay, when you're in the I think sometimes there's a confusion.
continuum of volunteerism. Mm -hmm. And like, if somebody's new to the organization, you can maybe start out with them either co-chairing a task or kind of shadowing or whatever, getting to know the organization. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, build them up um, to a larger role. Great. And a lot of times people will be more easy, they'll volunteer more easily if they have maybe a co-leadership or co-responsibility in the beginning, like right. working with someone. Great. Yeah. Nice mm -hmm. theory. Yes, mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. in the majority within peer groups and then across generations. So giving authority within peer groups and then across generations. Or across generations. Oh, or so across. Okay. So how, how, how are you a leader within your own, with people who have the same level of experience as you? Or how are you a leader to people who have much more experience? So delegating authority within peer groups and, and or across generations. Great. And then I saw another hand here and then there and then we'll I'm gonna close it off. Yes. I think probably thinking about it, this point was covered, but uh, teaming up, you have the luxury of uh, being able to team people up uh, of like skills or even opposites depending on the situation. Okay. It can complement strengths. So. Okay. So Great. You would need more experience, but also look at skills and team up because if you're teaming up, then yeah, people hold themselves more accountable. Mm -hmm. And that accountability is a big issue, right? Mm -hmm. How, especially in a volunteer context. Uh, last word was not letting the new person get away because if somebody new mm -hmm. comes into the group and you don't. Correct. You don't engage them and don't give them a reason to come back, whether it's to have with somebody at the next meeting or to bring a refreshment or, or whatever, then that person's not going to feel, you know, that's an old group that they're not interested in. Right. Great. Well, so let's think about uh, our own specific skill sets then in how, how do we go about doing that? And I'll go back just to that. I know it was just a little exercise earlier, the arm exercise, which then became arm wrestling. And it reflects a little bit of our underlying assumptions about how we engage others. And so we have lots of good advice. We got, in most cases, good training as piece for volunteers. How do we work together? How do we maximize the resources we have available to us and the people around us? Yet, Sometimes our assumptions, if they remain untested, block us from really engaging folks effectively. So one of the main tools we have for influencing others is ourselves. That's your main tool of influence, right? If you would like to get a volunteer on your team, it's you and your communication skills that's going to move that to the first level at the very least. Then afterwards, if they've got something fun and they're engaged, then that's going to hold them. But it's your ability to engage effectively from the beginning that is one of your most powerful tools as a leader. So, yes, Jim. Maybe a bit of a tangent that I would add to that, the ability to ask questions and listen ah. well. No, this is exactly the direction we're going in. Exactly the direction we're going. So let's do a brief exercise. And in this case, let's just have a, a pair, any pair at the table. Everybody else at the table is going to be like just observers and you're going to take notes. It's really a couple, it's a minute long exercise. So is there a pair at each table, a volunteer pair? Okay. Okay, so every table you got a pair. Everybody, can you just raise your hands? Who who is who are the who's the pair? Okay, so on the pair, one of you is the buyer and one of you is the seller. Just decide between yourself. Buyer, seller. the seller. Everybody knows who we are. The buyer knows who we are. Seller knows who we are. Okay, so. The seller, if you are a, the person who's going to sell, just in your mind, think of an object, any object, 
that has some value to you, at least a little bit of value to you, right? Because you're going to sell this to the buyer. So everybody, every of the pairs, if you're the buyer, you've got that in your head? Got that object? Ready to go? Keep? Just pick any object. Not maybe the water bottle or the pen. That may not have enough value for you persuasive. Okay. So now everybody else sits at the table. Everybody else sits at the table. This is your role. I want you to observe and note down your observations as the conversation occurs between the two. Just whatever comes to mind, keeping in mind Jim's comment about question, just you just observe the conversation between this pair, and I am going to ask you questions in a moment. All right? Did, so did that's you, your role. Yes. Did you give any introductions to the buyer? Not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're way ahead of me. All right, so the pair's ready. The seller has their thing in mind. OK, the seller, now please start. You have one minute to sell to the buyer. Sell your product to the buyer. The rest of the people at the table are observed. I'm so worried about <laughs> Observers, I just want you to think about, and then I'm going to ask you what it is. Between this is the observer, not the buyer and seller, just the observers. What percentage of time did the buyer speak, and what percentage of time did the seller speak? What percentage at your table of that pair? What percentage of time? What percentage of time does the buyer speak? Question and answer. Okay. 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 So let's get some. Okay. So back here. What's what's your? Who's the buyer? The seller. The buyer. 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 Seller. Seller. And and for the rest of you, what was the percentages? Okay. So seventy seventy percent the seller spoke. How about here? 
It's not only to balance your advocacy with inquiry, it's to begin with inquiry. Cultivate that sense of curiosity. And it's hard to do, actually. It's really hard to switch off our desire to, I'm so persuaded, Jim, that I know you'll like this and you'll have fun when you join my group, to turn that off and ask questions about what they might be able to bring to your group. What might they be interested in? How might they want to contribute? But if we begin with that inquiry process and active listening, including playing back what you've heard, then you'll be able to target your, your advocacy much more effectively. So, any questions about this as it relates to your, or comments, as it relates to what you're currently doing in your group's learning? Um, you have earned the right to inquire. Hmm. What might that mean, if I earn the right to inquire? It's creating a relationship with the other person such that you literally have the right to ask some of your questions. Rather than assuming, I showed up at this meeting, so therefore I'm naturally going to volunteer, it's, okay, why are you here? What? And it's sharing your perspective. It's sharing your perceptions as well, so that you build some trust, some relationship with that other person, in order that your question will be answered. I don't know about all of you, but I work a lot now in, in Africa mostly. Um, and I find that people will not readily respond to my questions. They kind of want to know, even people I've worked with a lot, um, because they want to understand what that relationship is. How will you use that information once it's been shared? So then you want to create the relationship and earn that right then to ask those perhaps more sensitive questions. Other questions about this? Or how then, how, think about your strategies as leaders for engaging your groups. What's the relationship there? What's helpful about it? Where do you take these skills? Do you have your, raised your self-awareness? Um, <laughs> Olga and I are going to do a short exercise because this is a perfect moment for that. And then we're going to wrap up. So just to, I'm going to ask Olga to read something. And I'd just like you all to listen. Ready? Mm -hmm. In 2008, the the Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, how many people understood anything? <laughs> it was music. No, it was music. <laughs> you were both speaking English. Okay, excellent. Did anyone take anything away or understand anything about what we might have been reading? Something global. <laughs> <laughs> so, you caught a few words. That's the whole thing. They say that there are certain people actually listen to two people speaking at the same time and distinguish between the two and capture the message of each. I have never met such a person, but apparently it's true. I can listen to one, but Right, and just ignore. Well, and in fact, that's what's happening to all of us. Imagine that Olga is the person that I'm trying to, she's on my board, we work together, and uh, sometimes we have a difficult relationship, so, I'm trying to listen to her and see her perspective. So her voice is there, but see, my voice is also going in my head, right? And we call that our internal voice. And you're saying, what's internal voice, Liz? That's your internal voice. It's that message that says, oh, it's really hot in here. Isn't Liz going to be done? Or I'm really sleepy after lunch. I wish we'd do another kind of exercise or let's take a break. That's your internal voice. That voice is going all the time. It's normal. You want to be able to listen and evaluate what you're hearing. You prepare your question after what you've learned. So our internal voice is always there. 
The challenge is we want to turn down the volume a bit on that internal voice so that we can literally focus on the other person. And sometimes the internal voice is louder than the person who's across from you. you we end up listening to ourselves, frankly, especially in difficult con situations, more than we listen to the person who's opposite us. And that's where, it, as leaders, we can get ourselves into trouble. And if we recognize this, that's where we have a tool for influence. And the diagram I like to use, because it kind of helps me. So you know you need to deal with something, that there's all these emotions and feelings and, that are going on for you. The challenge in, uh, as a leader, you're constant, it's not just you you're dealing with, right? You're dealing with other people. So the gap that exists, right, <laughs> between what your colleague is saying and what they're thinking, that's what you have to work on, right? It's narrowing that gap between what's said and what the internal voice is actually shouting sometimes in their heads. And not only is it a problem because it happens to each of us, it's a problem because it happens in the conversations on both sides, right? So as leaders, we have to be hyper aware of some of these communication dynamics because it's our role, as I say, we are our best tools of influence. And the more effective we can be at narrowing the gap between what is being said and what is being thought and sometimes shouted in the internal voice, the more effective we'll be as leaders. And you can see it sometimes. It, when you're speaking with someone, especially someone you know well, maybe one of your colleagues on the board, you know when they've checked out. You know when they're no longer paying attention. You know when maybe something's bothering them. Their body language says it to you. They're, the, they're normally asking lots of questions, and in this case, they've stopped asking questions. You, you can tell when their internal voice is louder than your voice across the table. So you take a step back. You use some of those inquiry skills, and you say, ah, sounds like, I think we're not on a topic. What do you think? Where's your head at? What do you think about this idea? Just stop talking and ask the question. Put it back on the other person in order to help you narrow that gap. Because if their internal voice is so loud, you can advocate all you want, and you won't have an opportunity to persuade them to work with you. Any questions about that or the tools? Okay, I think I'm the clock, so I think I'm, it's amazing. Oh, well, I, we'll just cut it short. So <laughs> there's always a lot more that we can say. Uh, but I will be participating throughout the rest of the conference. And if you have any questions or want to share your own thoughts, happy to answer any questions at all now or uh, at